invite you to turn in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 8. We've just been preaching our way through the Gospel of Luke, just going chapter by chapter, and we're in chapter 8, and we'll start reading in verse 4, as we are coming to the section where Jesus begins teaching in parables. Let's read that together, Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. When a large crowd was coming together, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed and the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. This point in Jesus' teaching marks actually a shift in his style and, and what he was uh, focusing on. He'd been spending a good bit of time, uh, no doubt, doing miracles and uh, demonstrating a, a great deal of compassion and mercy, but things begin to shift at this point. It is at this point in the life of Jesus and his teaching that he begins teaching in a way that was uh, kind of confusing to his initial disciples, and they kind of questioned why, why this, this sudden change. It seems as if things are almost kind of murky to be able to see it so clearly. In Luke chapter 8, verse 4 says, He spoke by way of a parable. If you read in Mark chapter 4, verses 33 through 44, we find that at this point, not just this parable, he says, He taught everything in parables. Everything he said was going to be in a parable from this point out. And it was going to be very, very difficult for a lot of individuals to come to the center of what it was he was getting at. And we're going to see why he does that and have some applications for ourselves. But notice there, Mark chapter 4, verse 33, it says, With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them, so far as they were able to hear it. That's the key. So far as they were able to hear the message he was teaching. And we're going to look at that here in this parable. But it says that he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. What we actually see is Jesus is uh, kind of straining out those that have come from all these cities many people have come to be with him now he's straining out all the crowds and he's looking for pure honest dedicated disciples some may think this is kind of odd you have all these people here why not do everything you can to keep them and more people coming well Jesus is looking for those to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, he's looking for those genuine, honest truth seekers. And this way of speaking in parables was specifically designed to kind of weed out 
maybe the, the casual curious seekers or those individuals who had kind of a, a misguided thoughts. You notice that it says that he was speaking about the kingdom of God. That word kingdom was kind of like a buzzword. It conjured up all kinds of preconceived ideas, all kinds of thoughts that people thought when they heard that word kingdom. You and I are kind of there the same way. We have certain, uh, no doubt, items or, or words or, or, or things we're very interested in. The minute we hear that word, it just brings us to mind maybe our past experiences, uh, maybe certain expectations we've come to have. It may or may not be exactly what that word or what that item wants us to understand, but we have to work hard to weed out those preconceived ideas or expectations that may not be precisely what it's about. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's preaching in a way to try to actually cause those who, who have a casual understanding or, or maybe uh, have preconceived ideas about the kingdom and will not be satisfied when they hear the way that Jesus preaches about it, that they'll actually go away. Notice what he says there. His purpose is actually to weed this crowd out. He says there in verse 9 when they ask us, why are you preaching this way? His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said to you, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Words, these were individuals, the private disciples, those who would come, come back for more lessons. They would come back for more instruction. They would come back and say, teacher, teach me what this means. There were some, the minute they'd heard uh, a lot of the things that he was teaching, would say, this doesn't sound like what I'm interested in. Or this doesn't sound like what I came for. And they would gradually go away. That is exactly the purpose why Jesus does this. Notice what he said. He said, I'm doing this on purpose. To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is imperable so that, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Jesus was specifically looking for the individual who wanted the truth. He wanted those who wanted the truth to find it. And if they sought the truth, they would receive it and they would be benefited by it. They would be saved and they would grow and multiply. And so that's what we see here is, he, is happening. In fact, we go a little bit further down in the text and we find exactly that this was really a test to ask how they were listening. Here's a question for us that we're going to ask ourselves in this text. Do you hear what you want to hear or do you listen to the truth? Two very big different approaches there. When you open up your Bible, are you listening for what you want to hear? Am I doing that? Or are you honestly saying, I want the truth of God and I want to do exactly what it tells me? That's why Jesus began preaching in parables. He wanted to find out who wanted the truth and who... Who likes to hear for what they like to hear? But notice what he says there in Luke chapter 8, verse 18. The purpose of this parable is here in verse 18. Take care how you listen. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has. Notice what he thinks he has. This is misguided understanding. Some people come to the Word of God, they come to the Word, they, they come to maybe even to, to the worship services. Maybe just curious about what it's all about, maybe having ideas of what they might expect to hear. Maybe ideas of what they might expect to receive or how it might benefit their life. And very quickly, we begin to find out who wants just the honest truth of what God's Word has to say and we're willing to follow it. And if we begin hearing a more detailed account of exactly what God says, that it's not what I expect or it challenges me in ways that I'm not prepared to be challenged, and I then begin to distance myself, right? I don't come around anymore. That may indicate I have a listening problem. I'm listening for what I want to hear. Jesus wants individuals to trust that He is the Messiah. And, that, and, that, and it makes perfect sense why He's come to that point in His teaching. He's in all these miracles. He's done all these great points of evidence that certainly nobody could do this unless he did it. But what was the purpose of the miracle? So that individuals would hear his preaching. They would hear his teaching. They would hear his truth. And they would then be validated that they would follow it and they would obey it. And what we find is actually as we break down this parable, we find that there were all kinds of, of individuals that had all kinds of different ideas of what they thought. Let's go back to the parable and, and read this together. Luke chapter 8, begin, beginning in verse 9. 
He says his disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. Again, the, the meaning of the parable ideally is to sift through individuals that did not necessarily want the genuine truth, that would actually seek it. He says, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it has been parable, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they will not believe and be saved. Look, remember the picture that he had that seed is beside the road? The picture Jesus had when he preached this parable was that a, a bird would come and pick it up and take it away. And sometimes our, 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 our thoughts are sometimes like that. You ever have maybe, a, maybe it seems like this is a, a random thought. It's like a bird just kind of comes through your mind, just picks up little things, right? Just picks up what it wants and then maybe flies away. And maybe, what, maybe you're watching television. Maybe you're reading a book. Maybe we're actually listening to a sermon. And a random thought comes in your mind. And if you aren't centered on wanting to know exactly and focusing and wanting to know more detailed information on either the sermon or the book, or the movie you're watching, what's that random thought going to do? It's going to take you away. It's going to take your attention away. In other words, these were individuals who just wanted to be around the excitement. It certainly was exciting when Jesus was raising people from the dead. It was exciting when people who couldn't see all of a sudden could see. And it was exciting when Jesus would go and cause somebody to, to walk who had never been able to walk. But that's exciting. And there were a lot of people that wanted to be around just the excitement. But when they found out that there was actually study, when they found out, wait a minute, I, I, it, it may not be always exciting, this, this Bible study, I actually have to discipline and find out what does this mean and what does this apply to my life. That may be, might be very exciting. What does the devil do? Oh, let me think of something else that's more exciting, more appealing. Let me think of something that more maybe is about what I came here for. Some are, some are like that. Jesus intentionally preached that way to find out who was genuinely wanting it. And those that didn't want it, they would find out. They would just drift away. He says he did it on purpose. I'm preaching in parables because I want to find out who's not just interested in just curiosity of the exciting appeals. Other groups, there were certain individuals that loved the idea of Jesus having authority. Authority over death. Authority over life. Authority over nature. And there were individuals that looked at that as if, if we had someone like that as our king, oh, we would destroy our enemies. We would not be what? We would not be persecuted anymore. What did Jesus say? Some would start off real excited. And then when persecution hit them, they would stop following. In other words, the teaching of the kingdom was never designed to give people... Uh, 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 Relief from their enemies. In fact, it was to cause them to love their enemies. <laughs> he didn't preach the kingdom so that all of a sudden they'd be the victors and taught them that if someone compels you to go one mile, go with them too. If they slap you on the cheek, give them the other also. When they began realizing, wait a minute, you mean, you mean I may have to suffer for this truth? They didn't want that. I didn't come here for that. I didn't come to hear that message and so they drift away. Another group of people would be those individuals we thought, maybe, maybe there's some position I might get. Maybe this could help my finances. Maybe if I get my life, my life right, I follow this work message of the kingdom, maybe there's something in it for me. Some material gain or some prosperity I might gain by. And when they find out that the kingdom doesn't provide that, and they're all worried about the money, the situation that they're in, or the worries of this life, the pleasures of this life, they find out, well, wait a minute, the the teaching of God is not necessarily addressing that. Well, it would choke out their interest in the Word and they would pursue those things instead. But there's another group. Notice, as we back up, let's, let's back up and see this in verse 12. Let's back up verse 12. And verse 12 says, Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And, they, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while and in a time of temptation fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. But, but there's hope. 
but the seed and the good soil. These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart. What does that mean? It means they honestly want to know what the word really says. I want to know what this Bible that has all the authority that points me to God. I want to know every detail of what it says and I want to obey it. I want to do it. I want to understand all the gifts and the blessings and the, and the spiritual uh, uh, blessings of, of life in Christ that in, in all of eternity will give to me and all the things that's going to lead me to Him. I want that. And they hold it fast and they bear fruit with perseverance. Now notice it says that after he would teach this, those uh, disciples that wanted that truth, Jesus is going to set them loose. He says, I'm not, my intention is not to keep this secret. No, no, my intention right now, I'm just kind of sifting. I, I'm preaching in a way that's going to sift the honest seeker for the, the casual kind of uh, curiosity one. And, and when we find the genuine seekers, well, then your job is to go out and preach this message accurately, to preach the message of the truth. Notice what it says in verse 16. Here's what his, his overall goal is after they find the truth. Verse 16 says, Now no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away of him. In other words, here Jesus leads us to the, what's the end result? The end result is that those individuals who genuinely wanted to know desperately what God revealed to them in the word of truth as Jesus would preach and sit down and explain things to them, his goal is that they would then share that truth with others. He can't. He just can't have random people excited about God just going and telling people all kinds of things. They don't know what they're talking about. That's why he says, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to come down to come. Make sure you wait. We have some people that genuinely want the absolute truth, right? We have to come to that point. And when we have that complete understanding, they want to do it and they want to share it. That's what he's talking about. Those who are in it for the long haul. They want to see others benefit by it. They want to see others uh, encouraged by it because they are finding this for themselves. What they have... What they have more is being given to them. But what about the individual who's just not that committed, not that dedicated? It, it just doesn't appeal to what they thought they might hear. Even what they think they have, what initial faith they thought they were going to put into this message, and they, they, don't, they don't want to follow through with it. Even what they think they have is taken away. They stop following, they stop growing. This really is repeating itself in the manner of our preaching and our teaching as well. Those who have been the good ground, those who have received the Word of God. Again, Jesus said, my goal was to send you out. You're like a lamp. I didn't want to keep it hidden. I want to make sure you share this with others. But this process begins to repeat itself because as we go out and we preach the truth, we need to make sure we're preaching it accurately according to the way of God. And it will also sift out those individuals as we see here in the parable. Remember in, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, I will build my, my church. That's kind of a buzzword today for a lot of people. As much as the word kingdom was a buzzword for people, the word church is a buzzword for people. They heard that word church, a variety of things come to people's mind. They hear, oh, come to church. Or uh, I'll let you come and visit where I go to church. And the question is, do we want to understand when Jesus said, I will build my church? That's for individuals that, that, that have... Uh, begin hearing about the truth? Do we want to know exactly what kind of a church Jesus is building? Do we want to be a member of the church that Jesus himself has established? Or do we want to be a member of a church that appeals to the things I want that church to be like? Or I want, I want to join a church that, that, that has all the kinds of things that gives me the things I, I'm looking for maybe of a materialistic, worldly nature. Are we looking for the church that Jesus built that has the spiritual blessings that are in it? Notice it says that there is a sifting way that even the apostles were taught to, to, to preach the word, and which they did, and we are instructed to do as well. 
that will naturally sift through and find the ones you generally want it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it said, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them. Why? Because they are spiritually appraised. This is very similar to the way that Jesus was preaching His parables. He was preaching about the kingdom to make sure people understood the kingdom is spiritual. It's not physical. It will not give you initially benefits that are on this or that's spiritual in nature. And we need to recognize as we preach about the church. And we have individuals interested in the church that we do the same thing. We recognize we're trying to preach things that are of spiritual benefit. And those who are spiritually interested will be like what we see in the end result of this parable. They will not drift away. They will seek, they will want to study, they will want to apply themselves to learn more about it, that they might get the benefits that are in it. Notice what it says in John 4, verse 23. Jesus himself said, I'm just doing what my father told me to do. I'm looking, I'm looking for certain people. While he died for everyone, while everyone has the opportunity, not everybody listens with an honest and good heart. That's the key. Not everybody listens wanting to actually be taught by the truth. John 4.23 says, But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. So our lesson for this morning is simply that. How do you listen? How do you listen? Well, the answer to that is when we just simply look at what Jesus has to say and just simply look at what the Bible tells us. And it may not be what we expect. It may not be what we thought. Do we still keep studying? Do we have the mindset, well, I, I, I know that Jesus is the authority. I know that Jesus is the King. I know that He has the keys to eternal life and I want to have that so maybe there's something I need to do to change and make sure that I understand what he's saying here. And maybe something I need to change about my life or my attitude that will help me be able to hear this and, and receive it with joy. That I might recognize that I might have benefits in obeying it. That's the question we want to have. Are you, are you willing to do that? That was the question. Let's just go back and just read, uh, back up a little bit. Let's back up to verse 16. And we're going to see one final application and then we're going to stop and uh, bring this lesson to a close. But verse 16. Verse 16 of Luke chapter 8 says, Now, no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen. That's all the key. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even when he thinks he has shall be taken away from him. Now notice verse 19. Gee, we're going to actually see Jesus apply this. Jesus is going to sift through a certain group of people that he takes preference over. That's going to shock us because the people who get the preference to be in his audience is not necessarily his immediate family. His immediate family wants an audience with him, but he has other people that are there. And he makes a distinction. He says, well, there are certain people that will have kind of preference into my audience. And kind of be having an audience with me. And it will be those who are like this ground we see at the end of the parable. Verse 19 says, His mother and brothers came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. It's kind of like, you know, if you've ever been in a long line at a restaurant, we say, I'm tired of waiting. Tell, tell, tell them, you know, they, they know me, you know, I'm. Tell them, Uncle Bob's here. <laughs> you know, I shouldn't even be to the front of the line. That's what they were doing. A huge crowd's there, and they want to talk to him. They say, well, I can't get to the crowd. Tell them who it is that wants to speak to him. Guess what Jesus says? Sure, I'll talk to you. So long as your, as your attitude like the people that are here in this room, that are hearing the Word of God and want to do it. Notice what he says in verse 20. And it was reported to him, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. There is no preferential treatment Jesus gives to audience members. The only ones that he's willing to give an audience to that will benefit from his, his eternal life and his his power that, that He has for salvation is unless we hear His Word gladly and want to do it. 
So that's the simple question we want to ask. If you're with us, are you willing to hear all of what the Word of God says? And trusting that it is the Word of God, that it is God breathed, that it is inspired, that it has the ability to give us everything that we need pertaining to life and to godliness. I'm going to read a few verses in Acts chapter 2. I want to see an example of someone that, a group of people that should be emulated, that we should follow. In Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 36, Peter gets to the end of his sermon trying to encourage his audience to realize that they actually had put to death Jesus. And while they thought they were serving God in this, found out that they were actually disobeying. They put to, put to death the Christ, the one who God sent to deliver them. And verse 36, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they what? When they heard this. What's that parable we just talked about? All about? It's about how you listen. See an example. This, this wasn't pleasant to hear, was it? No, it says what, what the reaction was. It says it pierced their heart, pricked their heart. It pained them to hear this. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. It wasn't, it wasn't pleasant at all. Made them feel guilty. Made them feel remorse. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, here's the good ground Jesus is looking for. When they heard this, they said, what shall we do? Those who had more would be given. They accepted the premise of that initial statement that they were wrong, that they needed to change. And then the next statement was, well, then what can I do so that I can be right? That's the good ground Jesus was looking for. And he was literally sifting through the crowds. He didn't have time all day to entertain every, every whim, every request people had. He was looking specifically for those who wanted the truth. And these individuals were wanting it. And notice what it says. When they asked the question, what shall we do? Peter said... He gives the answer, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. We simply ask the question, how do you hear that message? Are you the good ground? Are you good and honest? If you are good and honest, and you accept that Jesus is the Christ, you respond like they did, and they all were baptized. Those who heard that word, glad they were baptized, they received it, they did what the word said to do. We encourage you, if we can help you in any way, won't you receive that word gladly? Won't you be the good ground and receive even more benefits, not only the salvation of your sins, that as we rise up out of the waters of baptism, but as you walk in newness of life, that you continue to receive the teaching of Jesus Christ, that you might even live a more richer and fuller life spiritually with Him. Won't you? Come and respond to the gospel. We're going to stand and sing this song. Once you come to the front, we'll assist you in obeying the gospel. We stand and sing together.